Thanks for um, coming by, everybody. Um, my name is Greg Nyheisel. I'm a CTO at Astronomer. Um, Astronomer, our goal is to pretty much help companies adopt Apache Airflow, um, and we use Kubernetes to do, to do a lot of that. So um, today, I just want to talk about kind of <clears throat> quick overview of you know, Airflow and Kubernetes for anyone you know, kind of learning the, learning the, the ropes there. Um, talk about running Airflow at scale, and what does that mean? Um, we'll get into that. Um, some of the major design considerations, uh, just to kind of think about if you're going to be you know, pushing this out at your company, um, and just some of the things that we've learned along the way as we've kind of built this um, service up on top of Airflow. So what is Airflow? It's a task scheduler written in Python to programmatically author schedule and monitor uh, DAGs. Um, so several people on this track have already kind of mentioned Airflow, <laughs> um, and even the Kubernetes piece, the last talk, so that's kind of cool. So um, the groundwork is laid. Um, it's also a top-level Apache project um, as of a couple months ago, some impressive stats. So real quick, just the kind of the core concepts of Airflow uh, for anyone unfamiliar. DAGs are kind of the big thing. Um, there's a picture of one. It's um, DAG is created in code, uh, which is important. For, for Airflow, it's one of the differentiating features between it and some of the, maybe some of the, the workflow engines that do a declarative kind of approach uh, to workflows. Um, a DAG run is you know, an instance of that DAG running in time, so typically these, these DAGs are scheduled on a, a cron, cron tab kind of syntax, um, you know, every night at midnight, every hour, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and then a task instance is just you know, an execution of one of those uh, nodes in the graph um, during a DAG run. Um, so those are, those are kind of like the core concepts of Airflow. I'm not gonna dig too much into Airflow, um, kind of more geared, gearing this talk towards the Kubernetes uh, side of things. Um, a couple screenshots here. Uh, so there's just uh, the DAG view. This is just a stupid little DAG I do demos with. Uh, it just prints the date <laughs> and sleeps. Um, here's another view of Airflow. Um, just the tree view, kind of shows the DAG you know, running over time. Uh, here's a little screenshot of the log viewer. So as you're kind of writing your DAGs, you're pushing code, things break inevitably. Um, this is a good place to go to kind of see why a task failed, um, hopefully. Um, and it has this code view. So here's what I meant by, you know, DAGs are code. It's just Python code. Um, you kind of just, you know, use the Airflow library, string um, tasks together and define the dependencies. Um, so, I mean, now, these days, Airflow's been around for quite a while. A lot of companies, obviously, have been integrating it into their stacks. Um, these days, I mean, it's gotten a wider kind of view of use cases, so a lot of it was kind of geared towards ETL use cases. Now, ML is kind of becoming a bigger, a bigger use case. Um, so orchestrating, like, training and um, publishing models and that kind of thing. Um, Higher usage, so now that it's kind of been ingrained into companies, um, a lot of more people are using it. It's there, you know, new engineers come on, they get trained on it. Um, it's just kind of part of the culture uh, these days. Uh, stricter SLAs, you know, once, you know, the way it goes, you know, you, you build up a POC, you get it out there, and then <laughs> all of a sudden the company's running on it, so things get more important over time. Um, so the SLA kind of becomes an important factor. Um, and then just this immutable infrastructure um, is kind of, you know, coming onto the scene. It's kind of like the standard way to deploy things these days. Um, so that kind of uh, is a little bit of a challenge um, just from the way that things were traditionally done with Airflow uh, up until as of recently. So, so Airflow is, you know, a highly, highly available, mission critical thing now that people need to think about. Um, so if that's the case, there's kind of a checklist of things. Um, here's a couple um, that you may want to um, have kind of knocked out before you, before you start relying on it. Um, so just a, a way to automate Airflow deployments. So I should have an easy way to just spin, spin up a new Airflow, tear an Airflow down, um, kind of just you know typical stuff there. So I also want to be able to push code all the time. Um, engineers are always iterating on Airflow DAGs. Um, so as it's part of the culture, you know, people are gonna be pushing more code, hundreds of tasks are executing a day, thousands of tasks, you know, lots of engineers pushing code. 
If that's the case, you probably have some questions around security and access control, who can, who can do what with Airflow, um, or which Airflow. And then uh, the observability aspect of things, so how do you keep track of what's going on um, externally from Airflow? So if Airflow goes down, how do you know? Um, or what's going wrong with it? And then uh, auto-scaling. So um, we have some great tools these days, and um, you don't always have to be on anymore, so you can kind of dynamically scale, um, scale things like a cluster uh, according to what's going on or what needs to be done. So real quick, Kubernetes, if you haven't heard of it, I'm sure everyone's heard of it by now. <laughs> it's a portable uh, open source platform for managing containerized workflow or workloads. Um, typically, with your working with Kubernetes, you're gonna be writing YAML, um, walls and walls of YAML. So, um, oh, just real quick. Yeah, so this is just a screenshot of GKE, uh, Google's managed Kubernetes, but you know, the typical way you, you do things now is you, you, know, you, split, you split your application up into you know, isolated chunks called microservices, and you push those out on Kubernetes. Um, so a couple of the core concepts of Kubernetes real quick before we dive in. <clears throat> um, pod, one or more co-located containers that kind of share things like volumes and ports. Deployment is a higher level abstraction that can manage those underlying pods, um, which is, we'll get into some of that and why that's important. Stateful set, that's just like a deployment. The only difference is you have <clears throat> a stable host name and uh, persistent volumes. So those, those pods spin up. If they went down, they'll mount that same persistent volume uh, that, they were, that they were using before. Daemon set, a pod just gets replicated to every single node in the cluster. And a namespace is, the official definition is a virtual cluster backed by a physical cluster. Um, so there's a tool called Helm. Um, it's pretty popular with, if you've worked with Kubernetes. Um, it's a great way to kind of manage all this YAML. So if you're writing YAML over and over again and you want to kind of abstract things out, uh, define little chunks that you can reuse here and there, um, Helm is a great way to do that. It also functions as a package manager for Kubernetes. So um, you can Helm install just like you pip install, or you npm install, or anything like that. Um, and, that is, and that can deploy, that can manage uh, you know, a whole suite of, of microservices um, pretty easily. So Helm's a great tool. <clears throat> um, so let's say I've been working on, say I have an Airflow cluster, or an, an Airflow chart um, that I've developed. An Airflow, a chart is just a Helm package. Um, so let's say I have you know, all my YAML, all my, you know, my, my charts kind of living locally. How do I get this thing running on Kubernetes? Uh, you just Helm install, give it a name, point to the chart if it's locally, um, if it's locally residing. Otherwise, there's a whole suite of stable uh, packages that already exist out there in a central repository. Um, so if I do a Helm install and I spin up all these different you know, components that you know, um, make up an Airflow cluster, uh, what, am, what am I actually deploying out to that cluster? And that kind of depends on, in a lot of cases, which Airflow executor you want to use. Um, so kind of talked about it a little bit here earlier in some other talks, but an Airflow executor is just a pluggable way um, to kind of distribute the Airflow workload. So when it's time to run a task, you know, the executor kind of determines well, where does that run? Where does that, you know, where does that task actually run? Um, a couple options um, exist. Uh, this sequential, local, or local executors. Um, there's two different ones there. As mentioned in the previous talk, you know, they just fork off, if it's time to run a task, they just you know, fork off a subprocess, run the airflow run subcommand, and pass it the, you know, the, the parameters that it needs to do its thing. That task runs, and that process dies, and um, you know, keeps on going. So it's good for, um, definitely good for simple workloads, obviously. A lot of people have had a lot of success taking that pretty far, um, especially with some of the newer things like a, the Kubernetes pod operator, which we can kind of get into in a little bit. Um, but eventually, you know, sometimes things will eventually need to scale out. Um, real quick, that's just kind of what the, if you're running the local executor on Kubernetes, um, that's kind of what it looks like, pretty simple. Um, just have a Kubernetes deployment managing a pod for the web server, the Airflow web server, and the Airflow scheduler. We typically use an external kind of managed Postgres, so I just kind of depicted it like that. But 
Um, those two things, living in a namespace, kind of happily running, nice and simple, all the tasks executing on that scheduler right there. So the traditional way um, up until you know, not too long ago to scale out um, Airflow was to use the Celery executor. Celery is a distributed task queue um, written in Python, backed, typically backed by either a Redis or a RabbitMQ. Uh, there's a couple other options there. The point is, is there's a dependency there. Um, you have to kind of manually manage the number of workers uh, that you want to have running, um, as well as the worker size, and that's, that's kind of becomes a problem you know, when you start talking about auto scaling and scaling to zero and those kind of things. Um, but either way, it works just fine on Kubernetes. Um, so this is what that could look like if I did a home install of this chart and I said, hey, give me the, give me the Celery Executor. Same thing's going on at the top, Airflow Web Server Scheduler running. The difference now is we have a Redis dependency optionally. Um, and then we also have uh, the Airflow workers, which can be you know, obviously like a, you can configure the, the number you want, you can have 20, you have whatever, um, and those could be however big you want to make them, you know, however much memory, CPU you want. Um, but they're always on. <laughs> Unless you use a Kubernetes horizontal, uh, horizontal pod autoscaler, but um, even so, it's still a little tricky. So um, the next, the newest executor um, to hit the scene is this Kubernetes executor. Again, talked about that in the, in the past, in the previous talk, but Big advantage here, um, in our opinion, is you can scale to zero or near zero, zero-ish. Um, each, each task runs in its own pod, um, and you can kind of configure dynamically, depending on what that, what that actual job is doing, you can, can kind of configure you know, X CPU, X memory, um, so you can kind of customize that on your cluster. Um, it's really nice, it's fault tolerant, so what it does is you know, as this thing is running, it's, it subscribes to the Kubernetes API uh, event stream. As tasks are finishing, it's getting notified of those events and it checkpoints where it is in that stream as it's going along, which, which is really important. <clears throat> um, and I'll get into that here in a second. Um, the great thing is that all these pods, you know, if you have a whole bunch of tasks running and the scheduler goes down, um, well, those pods will still keep running, running to completion. Um, they're kind of uninterrupted by you know, what's going on with the scheduler, uh, which is great. Um, straightforward and natural, there's nothing in between, there's no queue, there's no you know, any, any, any extra infrastructure you have to manage just to, to do this. Um, so with Airflow, if you've worked with Airflow before, you know, there's a couple different ways you kind of ship your code around. Um, one way with the Kubernetes executor to do this is to do a, an init container, git clone you know, your DAG files into a local volume before you run. Um, you could also mount the shared volume where those, those Python files happen to live. Um, or my favorite, um, you can just use the same, you can just kind of repackage your code into, a, into an image and then use that same image uh, for all your tasks. Um, so we're probably gonna talk a little more about that one here in a second. Um, so this is what the Kubernetes executor looks like if it's doing nothing. Um, just like the local executor. Let's say it's time to run a task. Uh, what happens under the hood? Um, the executor makes a call out to the, the Kubernetes API running on the master. It says, hey, I need to run, run this pod. And um, Kubernetes does what it does and runs the pod. So that the command that gets run inside that pod, um, kind of like the entry point of that pod, is just the Airflow run uh, command that would normally be forked off and run in the sub process or run in the Celery queue uh, or in, in the Celery workers. So that's how that works. And then, you know, if you're running a bunch of tasks, you know, um, you, you can just kind of keep launching pods up, up until you hit the ceiling um, of possibly a resource quota, um, which you can set on the namespace. So part of what you can do with the namespace is kind of set those upper limits. So if you want a particular airflow deployment to be constrained, you know, um, you don't want it to cannibalize a cluster, you can say, hey, you know, I only want X amount of pods to be able to run in this namespace or X CPU and uh, memory to be used. Um, and Kubernetes will reject the pod if, um, if those quotas are kind of being hit. So good way to keep, keep an eye on things. Um, learn that the hard way with Mesos. <laughs> um, so 
you know, if we have an, a running Airflow deployment out there, um, that infrastructure we just kind of looked at there, you know, how do, you, how do we update, how do we update um, the DAGs? How do we push new code? So people are pushing code every day, every hour in some places. Um, how do we do that? So back to Helm here. Um, so the, you know, with Helm, there's a concept of like uh, passing in variables uh, that can kind of get templated into your YAML, into your deployments. Um, so here I'm just kind of hypothetically setting this, this tag variable when I do this upgrade. So I'm saying upgrade this, this Helm chart that I, that I just installed, except this time for that tag variable, which is presumably associated with an image name, um, Let's bump it up to 002. You know, it's the second time we're going to deploy this. We have new code. We have a new DAG. Or we made an update. Um, what happens under the under the hood here um, is that you know the, the Helm upgrade will run. It'll update the the state in Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is backed by an etcd cluster uh, to to persist its state. Kubernetes uh, will kind of do the heavy lifting here. Do a do a graceful termination on anything that's kind of looking at that, that tag. So in this case, I would say that you know, the, the scheduler and the web server should get rebooted with that new tag. So if they were running version one, they're gonna gracefully shut down that version one um, and bring up version two in both of those pods. If task one and two are out there running while this happens, um, like we mentioned before, it's no problem. Those tasks will run to completion you know, Kubernetes will be aware of that event, and then when that scheduler boots back up, it's gonna resubscribe to where it left off in that Kubernetes event stream and say, hey, okay, task one and two finished. Or they didn't, and they're still running, in which case it doesn't really matter. Um, so, and then, you know, from that point on, any new tasks that are scheduled by that version two image um, can just be launched with the version two code, so the DAG, the DAG should exist there. Um, the cool thing about all this is that it kind of fits into just the way that people deploy modern software. Um, can fit right into CI, CD pipelines. So typical scenario we see is you know, people push up to master or cut a release of their Airflow code. That could trigger a build on whatever pipeline system you happen to be using. Um, at the end of that, run your tests, push up a new image to a, to a Docker re repository. Um, final step, Helm upgrade to the to the latest version and let Kubernetes take it from there. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, how do we how do we monitor this thing? So, it's always good to have like an external kind of monitoring system. Um, you don't want to just rely on Airflow to tell you what Airflow is doing. Um, so, um, and again, these are this, this is just a bunch of suggestions. These are just things that we've done and had a lot of success doing. There's a million ways to do things with Airflow. Um, but we think these are pretty good, pretty solid ways to do these things, um, especially on Kubernetes. So one way to do it is uh, with a tool called Prometheus. We could just home install that, pretty easy. Um, Prometheus, it's also a uh, cloud native uh, foundation project, just like Kubernetes. It's a time series database under the hood. Also has this kind of uh, pool-based metric system uh, where it will actually go out and scrape targets that you tell it to grab those metrics and then stash them in this database. Um, there's a great plugin, works flawlessly uh, with Kubernetes uh, to plug in, so it can do automatic service discovery, um, which is great. Um, by default, and out of the box, Airflow is emitting um, StatsD metrics. So StatsD is a little different than the Prometheus world. StatsD is more of a push-based system, so it's if you configure Airflow to push StatsD metrics, it's gonna actively push, you know, send these metrics out on an interval um, to, to some external server. That doesn't quite fit with how Prometheus is set up, so um, the folks at Prometheus actually have this StatsD exporter um, component, which is kinda nice. It can act as a bridge, um, so you can point that, make that thing your StatsD endpoint, you point Airflow at that and say, hey, send the metrics there. That thing will in turn you know, store those in memory and expose them out on an HTTP endpoint for Prometheus to scrape, uh, which all surprisingly works pretty well out of the box. Um, so um, with Prometheus, um, this is kind of how this looks in practice, a little, a little deeper. Um, we have Prometheus out here running as a stateful set, meaning it has that persistent volume. If you reboot it, kick the pod down, bring it back up, it's gonna remount that same volume, which is good. Um, and then it will 
uh, use its service discovery mechanism we kind of mentioned earlier. Um, it will pull the Kubernetes API and say, hey, give me any services, give me any Kubernetes services um, that have these annotations on them. So you can kind of say, okay, if a service is deployed to Kubernetes and has you know, this, this Prometheus scrape annotation defined on it, um, we'll start scraping it. Um, start scraping it for metrics. Um, and it'll keep, it'll keep track of a lot of these things like labels, um, which are great for um, this next use case. Um, so, you know, maybe I got a dev server. That's my, maybe that's my dev cluster. It's been out there running. We've been iterating for a while. Now it's time to um, install another Airflow for my team to use. Maybe it's the prod one or just another team in general, uh, just isolating themselves with another Airflow. Home install, boom. This whole infrastructure goes back out just the same. Uh, that new service is deployed out there. Prometheus automatically becomes aware of it and starts scraping it and ingesting metrics. So now it's ingesting metrics from two airflows. You just keep doing that. It just kind of keeps on working. <clears throat> so this is kind of some of the, this is a, you know, one view of some of the metrics uh, that the scheduler is emitting. Um, just, and this is a Grafana dashboard. So Grafana is a, a dashboarding tool that works uh, pretty, pretty great with uh, Prometheus out of the box. Um, you can see, you know, for instance there, you can kind of sort things out by the labels. So if I have a bunch of Airflow deployments, I got three kind of listed here, um, I can kind of drill into those, uh, for instance, and, and kind of zoom in. Um, this is another screenshot of, you know, some of the stuff that, you know, we do in practice. We, we're kind of aggregating some metrics from the scheduler itself. We also integrate some metrics from some other tools, like this cube state thing that just kind of gives you status of pods, just kind of keep an eye on things. Um, and we're also pulling some data. Um, we like to deploy, um, we like to deploy airflows with a PG bouncer, which is just like a connection pooling thing to kind of sit between it and the actual database so we can um, keep an eye on just how many connections airflow is using, especially when things are scaling out. You got pods running all over the place. Um, it can get a little unwieldy. So we, we're scraping metrics from that too. Um, we kind of pull them all onto this kind of central dashboard. Um, and there's just another look. Uh, we're also pulling you know, CPU, memory, Keep an eye on things, uh, pod statuses, everything running. Um, so um, after metrics, you know, logging is the next kind of big thing on the observability kind of ticket there. Um, Airflow has you know some of this stuff built into itself um, with this log, this this uh, log viewer. Um, the typical, the local executor kind of works out of the box. You know, it's nice and easy. It just kind of writes the the log files you know, down to the, the scheduler and then the web server knows kind of where to look uh, for those files if you ask for it. The problem is when you use the Kubernetes executor, um, you know, those tasks are running, those pod logs exist, you know, the, the, the task logs exist in that container. Well, what happens when that container is gone um, after the task runs, you know, we gotta figure out something else there. So um, Airflow, being Airflow, it's got a lot of uh, pluggable kind of interfaces. Um, so the logging is no different. Um, so it has several kind of remote backends for logging available. Uh, it's got, um, you know, let's see, an object store for the big three clouds. Um, so, and then, and then Elasticsearch, and I'll kind of look, in, look in closer at both of those here. Uh, so that's, yeah, we zoom in on that, so. So in the case of, you know, using one of the, the object store um, backends for the logging, uh, what kind of happens here is, uh, kind of the bottom first here, you know, as those task pods are running out there, they're just kind of normally, you know, writing out their log file to the local, the, the local file system um, that gets kind of scrapped when the container goes away. So when, once you, if you're configured with this, uh, the object store, um, one of these object store uh, backends, before that container shuts down, it'll take care of uploading that file up to whatever bucket, you know, you point your, uh, your, your uh, Airflow at. And then if you go into that web server, you click on a task and you want to drill into those logs, you know, it, all it does, that web server just makes that request out to pull that file down um, and then, then just displays it in the web browser. Um, another option is Elasticsearch. It's um, a little more involved, so it's, you know, depend, kind of depends on the use case, um, but we use it, so I thought I'd talk about it a little more here. Um, so this is what this could, possibly look like, um, it's a little crazier, but you know, the, the left there is just a normal Airflow deployment that we kind of had 
you've kind of seen running uh, before. On the right here is a different namespace where we have all this Elasticsearch stuff kind of running. Um, the, way, the way we can do this, um, we actually have a PR I kind of listed at the bottom there that we're, that we're actually working on or wrapping up um, to kind of allow some of this stuff. But if you configure the Elasticsearch log handler with our new option, we have a new option for JSON output um, enabled and standard out output. Instead of writing its task files down to uh, the file system, it'll actually just spit those, those uh, task logs out to the standard out of the, the pod that's actually running that task. Um, and then from there, we can kind of rely on some of the, the Kubernetes. Again, this is just, you know, we can, we can rely a lot on what Kubernetes does by default here. Um, so by default, Kubernetes will actually take anything coming out of standard out, stream those um, down to the actual host nodes, um, you know, it's like var lib containers, something, something, um, where all these log files exist. Um, we can run a FluentD daemon set. Uh, so, you know, a pod, a FluentD pod running on every single node can also mount that volume um, and kind of su start sucking in all those logs and shipping them up to the, the Elasticsearch uh, clients to be ingested. Um, so, a um, little more involved there. Um, one advantage of doing this is that if, with the object store kind of method, those task logs are not uploaded till the end of the task. So if you're trying to debug maybe a running task or something that's been, you know, maybe it's stuck or looks stuck, you know, you can't really check it out um, live um, until the end. So that's just kind of one, one, one of the shortcomings of, I guess, the object store. Uh, with, with the Elasticsearch plugin, it's actually nice. It's great because it'll actually, um, it kind of does like a live, live polling thing where it'll actually run query like every second, you know, looking for new logs and then streaming those down in real time uh, to the web interface. So you can kind of actually, as, as things are happening in real time, you can, you can kind of debug those, um, which is one of the big reasons we kind of opted to go this route for our kind of standard deployments. <clears throat> um, and it also has the advantage of, you know, the rest of that ecosystem. You can set up Kibana on top of it and do deeper, deeper log analysis if you wanted to. <clears throat> um, so, one of the, uh, the last things I want to talk about here um, is kind of this authentication and authorization piece. So Airflow by default, um, I think it has an LDAP plugin. I haven't used it, so I'm not too sure on how that works. Um, but if you're integrating this into your company, you know, uh, you want it to become more you know, native to what your company is doing. Um, there's a couple options. Uh, again, this is very much an opinionated view, um, so this may or may not work for some folks. Uh, but um, one way to do this with Kubernetes is to leverage uh, these things called an ingress controller. Uh, so an ingress controller, or an ingress in general, is just how you expose a Kubernetes service to the outside world. Um, so if you just launched these pods out into Kubernetes, but you wanted to get to them from the outside world, you kind of need uh, this ingress object and this ingress controller uh, to kind of help you do that. Um, so the way you utilize this, um, we use, we've kind of standardized on Nginx Ingress. It's a very well-maintained um, open source version of an Ingress controller. There's, a, there's like five or six more pretty popular ones um, out there. Differing feature sets, so you, gotta, you kinda have to look at that. Um, the reason we went with Nginx early on was that it was one of the first to kind of support this this uh, concept of like an external authorization um, uh, server. So we are rolling with that right now. Um, this is kind of what that looks like. This, this slide got a little crazy. I kind of ran out of room and started not drawing things. But um, on the left there, uh, we have this Nginx ingress controller uh, deployed. So it's just, it just gets deployed like any other Kubernetes service. Um, usually you run this thing with like an elevated, with elevated privileges. It has access to pull the, the Kubernetes API and pull down metadata about what's running in the cluster. Um, so it's very similar to how that Kubernetes, or the, the Prometheus plugin does service discovery um, using annotations. This ingress controller is actually watching that API. It's waiting for these ingress objects, um, which is kind of that thing with the drop shadow under it over there. Um, it's waiting for those, those objects to get submitted to the Kubernetes API. Um, and it looks, um, 
uh, the ingress controller just says, hey, you know, you know, we've submitted an ingress, con uh, an ingress object. They want me to expose this thing to the outside world under this domain, um, and it'll, it'll kind of take care of doing that. Um, the, the, the Nginx ingress controller is kind of exposed as a, you know, in Kubernetes, you would, you would give it a type of load balancer so that it, it is actually exposed to the outside world from, typically one of the managed cloud providers have a load balancer solution that kind of fulfills that. Um, so like Google has like, you know, their global load balancer system that it kind of ties into. Um, and all the other clouds kind of have their own implementation. But um, once traffic hits that Nginx um, from the outside world, it kind of takes care of routing it to the, to the, to the backing services and, and then ultimately the backing pods. Um, so what's going on here is, you know, it's watching for ingress um, objects to be submitted all the time. Um, let's say a, a request comes in, you want to see someone's logging in, they want to go check the logs on an Airflow DAG. Um, so that's, that's, that's traffic you would consider from the outside world, typically. Um, so that's coming into the cluster. As that request is coming in, um, if you have this, this ingress uh, configured properly, you can say, hey, any, any requests that come in, forward them down to this authorization server. Um, and if that server returns a 200, um, I'll, let the re I'll forward the request down downstream. Um, if it doesn't, return an error message or something like that. Um, one thing I didn't depict here because I ran out of room um, was, you know, a login page. So part of this ingress, part of the the, um, the specification for these ingresses, in addition to the auth server, you can also say, well, if it's if you return a, an error code, you know, where do I go to log in? You can point it to redirect uh, over to some some other site that you run. And these could be these could be things like uh, auth zero, Okta. Um, you can kind of integrate with those kind of tools to actually kind of fulfill. You know, a lot of the, the authorization um, heavy lifting. So the way we do it um, is we, we issue a JWT. Our authorization server issues JWTs. Um, so JSON web token. That web token um, is encoded, contains a, you know, a couple important bits of data. Um, we are in the process of kind of integrating what we do in terms of RBAC down into um, some of the stuff that uh, you know, Airflow has this new, uh, this new piece called, you know, I think like the RBAC dashboard. Basically, it's like Airflow has introduced, you know, the ability to grant certain users the ability to look at certain things or trigger certain actions. Um, so that's new in the more recent versions of Airflow. We, we, we have written a uh, security plugin. So this is all just using stock Airflow stuff. We didn't have to hack anything. Uh, this just fits right in. We wrote a little security manager plugin that sits you know, it's just Python. It's configured with the Airflow web server. We just say, hey, you know, this is our security manager plugin. Point to the class um, that, that exists in the image. And when that request comes in, we can use that security manager. We can read that JWT, um, you know, decode that, read some of that information. And what we do is we embed uh, role data and um, some, 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 some additional user data. Uh, but the important part is a role. Um, so we can say any role that lives up at the astronomer level, which could be, you know, in your companies, which, you know, that could be anything that's completely custom. You could pass that down and say whatever, whatever I exist as in my company, you know, pass that down. This thing could make the decision to say, okay, well, let's translate you into, you know, uh, just an Airflow viewer or just an Airflow editor. Or maybe you have full, full op privileges, which you can, you know, complete, complete control of the Airflow cluster. Um, so um, that's kind of how we're handling that. It's a lot, um, but you know, this is like the probably the ultimate flexibility in terms of you know kind of handling this, this stuff on Kubernetes with um, with Airflow. Um, so getting towards the end here, uh, this is I just uh, didn't fit in the category, so it's a special mention here. Um, but this is uh, there's a with the Kubernetes executor, there was also this Kubernetes pod operator introduced. Um, so instead of just running, you know, the Airflow tasks as you normally would um, using this, like the, the standard plugins, what you can do is actually launch a custom image um, that can do something totally different. It could run Java code, R code, or you know, whatever you want. Um, so what we see as we're helping companies adopt Airflow is if they have some crazy dependency that doesn't doesn't it clashes with their, their their normal code or just as a pain to deal with otherwise, we say, hey, just make your own image, build it over there, um, 
and then just host it somewhere we can get to it or, or give us a password or give us the Docker login to get to it so we can pull it down. Um, and that just unleashes, you know, the, you know, you can do whatever you want um, in, that, in that scenario. So again, Airflow, super flexible, kind of um, allowed us to kind of build all these different integrations uh, on top of it. Um, and really customize it um, and build, build a platform on top of it. So um, that's all I got. Um, thanks for swinging through. I wanted to ask a little bit about the RBAC. Yeah. Um, so are you saying that like you with the astronomer level RBAC, it actually takes advantage of Airflow's RBAC, and like does that actually um, allow for like multiple tenants to be on the same Airflow instance like securely? Ooh. Um, we don't do multi. So we don't do multi-tenant with it. It's it's typically just one tenant, um, mm -hmm. as an, a tenant being like a, an organization or a company. Mm -hmm. um, so the way that we do it is we, you know, we have, we have an API layer that's kind of houses, you know, some astronomer level stuff um, that fits into our UI, fits into our ecosystem. Um, so in the astronomer layer, you can kind of go in and you can say, hey, I want this person to be, you know, an, an owner or an admin or just a viewer. Um, at the astronomer layer, that could mean, that means that kind of wraps into the deployment thing. So if I'm just a viewer on a deployment, you know, I wouldn't let you, I wouldn't let you push a, I wouldn't let you push an image up to the repository, um, mm -hmm. and therefore propagate it to the running cluster. Um, so there's a couple of things that we want to handle at our layer, um, but then we also want to leverage that same system and just propagate it down into Airflow, um, so that you know we we can essentially map our roles down into Airflow roles, where we can take advantage of some things at our layer, while also letting people use the, the native stuff. And airflow. Thank you. Yeah. So just comment on that one, actually. So, so Airflow ship with uh, Airflow is security manager. So basically, it's extend for the Fab security manager. Yep. So I believe like astronomer also build a astronomer security manager, which extend the Airflow security manager, yep. so that you could all write certain or permission uh, management code, so that you could still do multi tenant to manage. 